today's workshop. Um, Keith here is a professor here at Sussex in International Education and Development and a former president of BASE, actually, and very active individual with Upfit activities. So a good person to have here that represents both organizations. Um, Keith is a long time previous director of the Center for International Education here, our host today, and um, is the director of the CREATE, and I see he's brought some CREATE materials for us here, but the DFID funded CREATE consortium. And most recently, he's been working a lot with the Commonwealth on their post-2015 development planning and is serving as the technical advisor to the Commonwealth ministers on post-2015 goals. Is that your correct title? <laughs> <laughs> so Keith's agreed to talk to us for 20 minutes and then guide us through some questions and answers and more of a workshop type on that. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, see you all here and to address this association which I've known for as long as it existed and its predecessors. Um, that's a long story and also of course this story about MDGs and EFA calls is a long story. Um, the current um, version of this really has its antecedents in 1990 in the meeting at John Tien. Um, people are more likely to know about the meeting in Dakar in the year 2000 um, but it was preceded 10 years before by a similar meeting which resurrected promises that were first made in 1961 by the international community about education for all, or the similar sentiment of universalizing primary education. So it's a long story, and I think one of my messages this morning, if, uh, this afternoon, if you're engaging with this outcomes that we see now with a high-level panel, um, and, and uh, at least 100 other groups who've published papers, <laughs> post 2015 is to say to yourself well do look back do look back at 2000 do look back at 1990 and see if we've really progressed now, we talk about learning organizations we ought to be learning organizations and what we are doing now should be manifestly superior in some way to what we did before it should build on it, it should move forward uh, and I'll leave you to make your own conclusions about whether that's what's happened or not um, but uh, some of my remarks will be addressed to that sense of whether we've actually progressed. Maybe we've gone sideways, and we could of course have gone backwards, uh, but we'll see. So I'll make a few remarks then around this discussion, this general architecture that has informed the SDGs, the MDGs, the EFA goals, and a long list of other things that circulate around that agenda. I will be talking though specifically about the educational stuff rather than the big, broad development agenda, which is a different discussion, clearly related, but it's not the same discussion, and if you try and have two, the, both discussions at the same time, you will get confused. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, what's it all about? Well, there are many versions of this, but it pays to reflect on why people think this discourse is important. These international development goals, which as I said, stem really from 1990 and then 2000, <coughs> clearly are unfinished business. Uh, there, there are a group of people, and particularly people who are attached to a rights-based perspective, who say, you promised to do this, you haven't done it yet, so keep going. Uh, it's unfinished business. Uh, it's rather interesting that the high-level group has a paragraph, if you've read it, and it says, now that universal access to primary education is almost achieved, and those of us who know more about it than the person who wrote that <laughs> say, no, it hasn't been achieved, what are you talking about? And it's not just the 20 countries on the margin. It's the fact that half the children in India don't reach the end of the elementary school cycle. 50% do not reach the end of the cycle. Nor do they in Bangladesh. Nor do they in Ethiopia. These are big countries. Nor do they in Nigeria. So what are you talking about that, that you know, half the job is done? It's not even half done. So there is a, a road to travel, particularly if you talk about universalising access to the right to education to effectively to grade 9, not grade 6. It's of course also true, from a development point of view, that this stuff is core. If, like me, you believe that development is a combination of knowledge and skill, 
which can transform your physical and mental well-being alongside the politics of development which determine whether you can utilise what you know and whether the benefits of it are distributed equally or evenly, I should say. Um, then you would agree with me that um, some essential part of the story is of development is an educational one. It is about knowledge and skill. How do you get it? Where does it come from? And it's particularly about thinking um, and what I sometimes call not the digital divide, but the cognitive chasm. When you start measuring what kids can do in different countries, and I'm talking about reasoning skills, not reading, there is a chasm. There is a chasm which, if you wanted to put it in primary school terminology of ages and grades, could be six years or even ten years of difference in populations, in population averages of abstract reasoning skills and how they're distributed. That's what makes a huge difference in terms of development. It makes a huge difference in terms of where FDI might go, foreign direct investment, and a whole bunch of other things. That's part of the story too. Third reason, of course, that this will be important is that although I've been in a stream of meetings recently in the EU, UNICEF, and elsewhere, where people are saying, we've got to have a big push. There's only, the clock is ticking. We only have however many months the people who say that actually never tell me whether it's January the 1st, 2015, or December the 31st. It now makes a very big difference. We have twice as much time if it's December the 31st, but nobody ever wrote that one down. Uh, but actually, the question is inconsequential now. Uh, anybody who's interested knows what the result is in 2015, either in January or in December, with a high degree of certainty. Uh, because the path has been set, there is no big push which is going to create a radically different result. And if there was, you shouldn't push, because you will wake up with a very big headache on January the 1st, 2016, having tried to do something in a hurry and not being able to sustain it. So that's not, no longer an interesting question, but it is an interesting question to look beyond that, of course. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly uh, for some, is what was the purpose of all this, and what was its greatest success? Well, in a nutshell, if you ask me, the greatest success was that it actually mobilised real resources of a magnitude which would not otherwise have been made available. The promise that no country would fail to reach these goals, the lack of a credible plan, was a half real promise. It really did move billions of dollars, albeit that it took a long time perhaps to get off the ground. But that money would have been spent on anything from tanks to dog food uh, if it hadn't been spent on education for all. So it was important, and it defined the architecture of the development agencies, the multilaterals and the bilaterals, uh, and it created a narrative which is in danger now in its big risk of being lost. The strong narrative that accompanied Dakar and John Tien is not evident in the high-level uh, panel. Um, at least I don't think it is. Of course, views may differ on that. Uh, but it just isn't there. It's not going to capture uh, in the same way the momentum to allocate resources and uh, there is indeed a high risk that the uh, bilateral and multilateral agencies find themselves being pushed away from the agenda that was originally uh, developed. Time is passing. Uh, I'm not going to read all this out, um, but you can take what you can from the list. Uh, these are some of the things that you hear people say frequently, which are critiques of what was done. It's easy, of course, to criticise. It's absolutely a lot more difficult to say, well, what would you have done instead? Um, okay, I mean, yes, it probably is true. It is true in some countries, the heavily aided ones, that the EFA MDG 2, 3 um, architecture did create situations where countries were told, uh, no, you can't have any money for your secondary schools. <laughs> it's got to be a, a basic education project at primary level. You've got to spend 50 or 60 percent of your education budget on primary schools. Why? There's never any good reason for that, historically. No OECD country ever did that. So why are we saying to other people they should do this? Failure to differentiate the starting points and the aspirations was obviously part of this globalised initiative, which wasn't really global, because EFA is a, is a product of more than anything else, UNICEF and the World Bank in 1990.
with, of course, contributions from many other groups. But it was centrally driven. The process now is very diverse. It has a huge number of different stakeholders, or groups who think they're stakeholders. A lot of single issue people who are saying, well, you must have disability, you must have gender, you must have this, that, and the other. And the list is enormous. And no means of breaking out from that, of prioritizing. I said I wouldn't go and read the list out, so I'm not. <laughs> I'll pick another couple. Um, there was nothing actually said in, in a serious way at either John Tien or Dakar about infrastructure and the physical aspects of education for all. And there should have been. And there isn't anything, maybe there is in the high level group, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, this is about latrines. Uh, this is about learning spaces, which are not cow sheds with holes in the roof. It is indeed quite unbelievable that in many countries, low income countries with low enrollment rates, it's still true there aren't enough schools physically. There aren't enough buildings. The buildings that there are are, are places that you would not want to spend any time in. And so on down the line. That is a money problem. It's one of the things that aid is actually good at doing. It's good at doing things. Building buildings. Maybe you build them in the wrong place, but you know. <laughs> That's your fault. I mean, <laughs> conceptually, if you can build a building, it's your problem to get it in the right place at the right time. Um, but it's not a technology that's somehow really difficult. Changing child rearing practices in a society is of a different order of magnitude than building a physical primary school. Okay, and of course, what we had before was a list, not a recipe. It's not actually a development strategy. And it's difficult often to see how you can change these lists into saying, well, you know, I happen to be Prime Minister of this country. What am I supposed to do? What is the strategy as opposed to the list of desirable outcomes? Okay, well, that's uh, famously the create model of uh, flows of children through a system. And this is a big point. I mean, it is a big point to see these goals, the objectives, the targets, dynamically rather than statically, fluidly rather than cross-sectionally. What you see today is the result of what happened yesterday. Tomorrow's dropouts are in school today. If you act on dropouts, you are not acting on the causes of dropout. So some of this frantic searching for a big push is of that kind. I mean, literally, of course, if you were to pursue a big push, you would be dragging, possibly screaming and kicking, <laughs> children back into school who dropped out. That is the only way you would reach universal enrollment by 2015. That doesn't make any real sense at all. Understanding the problem as a flow and acting in a way which sees it as a dynamic, um, you know, would, would be, um, I think, a rather intelligent thing to do, but you won't find much of that kind of thinking in the high-level group report. It's still seeing the problem cross-sectionally, most astonishingly, it's using data from Sakharopoulos and Patrinos and a study in 2002 of rates of return, which is based on data in the 1990s, which is a partial set of countries, and it's nonsense, but that's another story. The model, though, I think is useful if you want to, to debate these things, to ask yourself in terms of any of these EFA goals and strategies. Um, well, what's it doing for preschool? What's it doing for kids who never go to school, who are in households where no child ever went to school? What's the goal? What's the objective? What's the vector that would transform this? What's it doing for dropouts? What's it doing for children who are in school who are not learning? And children who don't go to secondary school? You can keep slicing this in as many ways as you want. But you can use it to interrogate these lists of goals and objectives of the high level group, of the GPE and everybody else and say, okay, well, let's just unpack it a bit. I mean, how does it address the question of children crossing this threshold from being enrolled to not being enrolled? All this, of course, is on the website, if you want to go there. In CREATE, we developed this expanded vision. And I think this is really important, because it's saying to pe those people who say, as the HLP says, we have nearly resolved this problem. No, you have not. In the countries you're talking about, including the rich countries, some of these things aren't actually true. We have truancy problems in this country, in the older age groups. 
in terms of time on task and how you know whether a child is really there for 95% of the time. Fix your own criteria on that. Uh, so yeah, any kind of real, uh, realistic delivery of the intention behind education for all would satisfy these criteria. Yeah, people would be there all the time, pretty much. The teachers would be there all the time. Uh, they'd be learning in conditions where you could learn. They'd particularly be of the right age for their grade. I haven't found any reference in the HLP yet to possibly the single most important thing that could be done to improve completion rates in Africa and South Asia, and that is to make sure that every child entered at the age of six and completed at the age of 15. That nine years meant nine years continuous. The problem with Africa is that its population is young and its schools are old. In our samples in Create, more than a third of children are three years over age. This is, this is even true in uh, parts of South Africa. If you're three years over age, your story is just about finished. You will never finish secondary school successfully in most of these countries. And we have plenty of data that sort of backs that up. But that doesn't cost money to enter school at the right age. Or if it does, it's on the margin. And every country that succeeds in delivering the right to basic education doesn't have an ageing grade problem. Every country that doesn't succeed in doing that does have an ageing grade problem. So there's a certain set of things there. Um, okay, I'm not going to read it all out, but uh, stuff about teachers is rather important too. I mean, it's, not about, it's obviously about having enough teachers, it's about having them in the right place. Uh, we're creating a learning environment which is plausible um, uh, and, and with motivated people. Uh, and, and it's about the fact, the simple fact, that in um, China, in the coastal plains, in pretty much any city that you want to go to, you will find children learning formally for 240 days a year. That's before they have private tuition. And they start. 7.30 in the morning and they finish about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. If I try and replicate that in parts of South Saharan Africa and South Asia, I won't have any difficulty in finding schools that are delivering 100 days a year, at best, for 3 to 4 hours, if you're lucky. So, not even a half, but a third of the learning time. If the quality is the same, well, it speaks for itself, and even worse, if the quality is inferior, <laughs> doubly worse. <laughs> you wonder why on Tim's or Pisa or SACMEC, you get some of these results, and of course some of the results are a function of simply not being there in the first place. Time on task. Okay. Um, and the last one perhaps worth picking up. Equitable access to affordable public schools located within 30 minutes travel. It's the time rather than the distance that's usually important. But it's also the free. Somebody will correct me but I haven't seen in the high-level panel report a commitment to free education. It seems, it's certainly not to help front and prioritise. Uh, and you think, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? <laughs> Why is this? And how can you possibly deliver this promise uh, without being free at the point of delivery? It's another discussion, but it's obviously to do with the role of the private sector. Okay, well when um, I was thinking about this uh, a year or so ago and um, doing this work with the Commonwealth Minister's Working Party on post-2015, um, I came up with basically a prediction that there were six possible outcomes from the process. And you'll find this on the CCM website. And it looks something like this, you know, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you can either stay the same, just replicate the same architecture, you can reckon that you're going to improve it with an evolutionary reform of one kind or another, which enriches and deepens and expands the scope. You could do something entirely different, or you know, radically reform and take on the assumptions, the underlying development metaphor uh, and, and paradigm. You can, as many people have argued, say, well, it's just not possible to have this dream of a global architecture. It's got to be differentiated. It's got to be a light framework, a framework rather than a blueprint, within which you can carve out your own space. So if you're Rwanda and have a particular 
set of development ambitions which are not the same as Uganda or Tanzania, the framework should allow you to do that. Say so we're going this way rather than that way. Or, number five, with all the pressure on aid accountability that some people may know about, payment by results, where for every child that completes the cycle successfully and passes some test, you give the government of Ethiopia $100, which is what we do. You may not believe it, but it's true. I think it's maybe $50, whatever it is. But uh, to directly link performance with a reward, performance-related aid, retrospectively, you get the result and you get the money. You don't get the money up front, or you get some of it, not all of it. Creates a sort of IAG heavy, you know, this is heavy accountability, line by line, supervision, which some people would find very uncomfortable. Um, and last of all, and most disappointingly, you can have a rest in peace version of this, that it self-destructs <laughs> and whatever comes from the architecture, uh, nobody takes any notice of it. Uh, where have we arrived at? Well, again, I said, I think in the workshop and in the discussion, you can work out which one of these <laughs> results we, we're heading towards at the moment with where we've got to. So the high level panel came up with this. I don't know, how many people have actually read the report? Only. One, <laughs> Right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm at an advantage then. <laughs> I read it quickly. <laughs> um, that's what they came up with. Um, provide quality education by public learning. Um, increase by X percent proportion of children able to access and complete primary education. Sure that every child, regardless of circumstance, completes primary education, able to read, write, count, well enough, meet minimum learning standards. Every child, regardless of circumstances, access to lower secondary education. Increase the proportion of adolescents who achieve recognised measurable learning outcomes. There is a learning metrics group meeting at the moment, trying to determine what that means. Increase the number of young and adult women with, and men. And that sort of covers most people, doesn't it? Young yes. and adult. <laughs> okay. With the skills, including technical and vocational, needed for work. And I wish the person who translates that into an indicator that you can measure, good luck. It will either take them a very long time or they will give up before they start because it's so poorly expressed as a measurable outcome. But that's where we've got to. That is after a hundred cons country consultations. I can't begin to ex uh, explain how much effort's gone into arriving at this point. There is of course more to it and do read the high level panel report which is whatever it is, 100 pages long, um, and of course it has got a lot more in it, but um, if you want to strip it right down and say, well, we know what the EFA goals were, what is, and the MDG2, universalized primary schooling, that's the replacement. What did we do in the Commonwealth? Well, for good or bad, we thought uh, it would be useful to get beyond the generalisation which bedevils a lot of these conversations where people are saying, well, you know, is it sustainable? We need a new architecture. We need, you know, they're talking principles. We said, no, we've got to get beyond that. Time's running out. We have to say, what does the goal look like? You know, what are the words? Which order are they in? And then have a good argument about whether you can improve it. And that's what we did. And I think we were successful in creating one of the more coherent versions of what could be an architecture post-2015. Um, but you know, that's what you're here for today, is to argue about it. But it has the virtue of existing, it has the virtue of being endorsed by Commonwealth, which has 52 countries, um, and it may or may not be taken up by all the other actors in it, in some form or another. Every child completes a full cycle of a minimum of nine years of continuous that means you've got to be the right age and you mustn't repeat all the time and be 22 in grade 5. Uh, no way. Uh, for basic education, and demonstrate learning achievement consistent with national standards. That's trying to get together the learning goal with the participation goal. It's answering the question, access to what? You can't have one without the other. Of course, it's pointless to be there and not learn anything. Whoever would have thought otherwise. It wasn't true in Dakar that people didn't care about learning. Um, 
you know, it's complete nonsense the people who say that we forgot about it. It's there. Read the papers. The problem was people didn't indeed emphasize it in practice. Post basic education expanded strategically. What more can you say? I mean, it's going to be different in different countries. You've got to have a national plan and ambition as to where you're going, how much employment you've got, and how you've got to balance the outflow from this education system into the labor market. And lastly, one which has a lot of consensus, but is not given a great deal of prominence, not least because I think Cameron doesn't believe in it, um, is to reduce and seek to eliminate differences in educational outcomes amongst learners. Eliminates a bit strong, minimise is probably a better word. Um, victim of the drafting. Um, it's an equity one. Half our problem, not all of it, but half of it, is about equity. It's, education systems should be vectors for equality. Sometimes they are vectors for inequality. And whatever we're doing, and some of our analysis suggests this does happen, uh, in, in allocating aid and assistance, we shouldn't be increasing education inequality. But the evidence from some countries is that indeed that's exactly what's happened. Those were the principal goals, and we recognised a load of cross cutting themes which don't easily fit into one box or another, which go beyond education because they're cross cutting. And uh, we converted those into a series of more specific goals, five of them there, six of them, sorry, including infrastructure. Right, the time is ticking. Um, I have these on a piece of paper which I will give you so that when you have a buzz you can peruse them if you haven't seen them before. Uh, so that's somehow in the mix. Now I'll show you these. There's another list, one of, you know, a very long list of lists that one could look at. This is the one that my friends in Education International have been working with. Education International is the largest trade union organisation in the world, which says it is. Uh, because it's the umbrella for all trade unions, did you? Uh, target one, target two, 2030, every child, full cycle, continuous, free early childhood, blah, blah. Enables them to achieve their potential, all young people have equitable access post secondary. Now, if you don't like that, or you think it's not sustainable, doesn't satisfy some criteria, by all means, suggest the word that isn't 100 pages long. <laughs> it's got to be one sentence, two sentences. Uh, with these kind of indicators, and being EI, uh, just pick out a couple there, um, EI very keen on percentage of education institutions that are publicly financed and don't charge fees, and which aren't for profit. There's a feeling in EI that their wind is blowing in a direction that they are not sympathetic to. Uh, and of course for EI, percentage of children, young people taught by qualified teachers. That wasn't actually one of the HLP goals, interesting, um, and they've got infrastructure in there and a few other things, and curriculum. So that's an EI version of it. Um, I put these up um, uh, because I couldn't believe it. I, mean, I said this earlier. <laughs> so, so you got a high level group. This is a piece of evidence they put in there. These are rates of return, primary, secondary, higher. Right, for, um, I'm sorry, I've cut the, oh, no, 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 Asia, Europe, LAC, OECD, SSA. Uh, I hope people in the room know what a rate of return is. Otherwise, I'm talking double Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's implying that primary school has a, is a better investment than, than secondary, than tertiary. At least from a private point of view, and possibly from a public point of view. It's implying that in... Sub-Saharan Africa, the best investment you can make here is in primary school. This makes no sense now. In all the countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, which are not um, very fragile and in civil war or cross-border war, virtually every child, 90, 95% of children, do enrol in grade one. The problem is they don't finish. You don't see that if you look at it this way. And it's actually unlikely in countries where more than 60 or 70 percent of children do complete primary that the rate of return on primary is greater than secondary. This is nonsense. Uh, so it's based on historic data. It's a very strange thing to use. Um, and it sort of suggests that somebody wrote this in rather a hurry. But I don't know the history of it. But I find it very odd um, because 
an awful lot's been written about this kind of data, which shows that it's not robust. And uh, they put this one in as well. I also find this extraordinary. So we have a chart here, and it's the only chart about gender in the, in the, in the bit which talks about the gold. Uh, and it says, well, you know, we get greater gender inequality, well, equality, uh, if your GDP is higher. Oh, isn't that stunning? <laughs> what does it mean? It means that rich countries have greater gender equity than poor countries. Let's hope it's true. It looks like it probably is, at least it's currently. What's it supposed to mean, though? Get rich. Very strange choice. Because it's not getting inside what has happened over the last two decades, which is that the global transformation of the nature of gender inequality has been quite impressive. It really has moved and shifted in a way that the associations with poverty have not. And of course they interact with each other. Longer story than we've got time for. Now, I put that up, and I'm just getting to the end, um, to remind you that those goals of the high-level panel and so on have a certain kind of status and standing and will end up at the General Assembly in September and will be celebrated one way or another. These are actually the goals of the Global Partnership, which is, some of you will know is the mechanism through which the 50 poorest countries get a lot of external assistance where bilateral agencies pool their resources into a fund which is about two billion at the moment. And that's where you go to get your proposals approved. It used to be called the Fast Track Initiative, and it's now the Global Partnership. They've already got their strategic goals. Now these are in the strategic plan up to 2015. How do these goals map onto the high-level panel stuff? And I, you know, I invite you to try and do it, and you'll find they don't. You think, well, that's really interesting, because if I'm the Minister of Education, or more particularly if I'm the Minister of Finance, I'm going to talk this language. There's no money behind these high-level panel ways of looking at things. There is money behind this. So, you know, whether or not I think that's rational and makes sense and all the rest of it, these are the ones I'm going to be talking about if I'm looking at my next five-year plan and trying to get it funded. And they are different. So those were the goals of the high level panel. And I'm, sure, I'm sure you have been discussing them a bit. Um, they don't seem very, uh, I mean, it's not a, a, a laser vision on the wording of those goals. The first, the first target there is, is two. I mean, it's quite obviously. Increase the proportion of children able to access school is one thing. Completing the school when you access it is another. The language, and maybe it's lost in translation, to be able to access is absolutely not the same thing as accessing. <laughs> so if I'm in the UNESCO Institute of Statistics and somebody's asking me to determine if this has happened, I've got a lot of questions tumbling out saying, what did you really mean there? Um, the second one, I was tempted to say in a, in a Geldorfian way, you can imagine Bob Geldof saying, is that it? <laughs> is that the level of your aspiration? <laughs> is that all you think you can do in seven years of primary school? You know what I mean? I'm pre -prime. No, hopelessly unambitious. Um, you should surely go for more than that. Okay. Um, so, the challenge, if you go with this, is to say, how do you convert that into something that you would actually be prepared to give money for? If I am the GPE, if I am the competent authority which is supervising the aid program in country X, if I'm the treasury in the UK and I have an agreement with DFID, where I say, I'll give you all this money, DFID, 50 million pounds for Ghana, but you will show in three years' time, five years' time, that every child goes to school, every child can read and Okay, can I do that with those? I mean, how, how am I going to turn that into a measurable outcome, which I can say, okay, here's your 50 million pounds. And now, just in case anybody had forgotten, that's what we had in the year 2000. So, I finished there and invite you to discuss. That's what we had. 
What we now have is the high-level group stuff. We have many other versions that are floating around, of which I've only shown you a couple. Um, alternatives. And, you know, are we going backwards or forwards? And whatever your answer to that question is, where should we go? Where should we go? So, I think that gives you plenty to ruminate on. And I can give you the goals that I've been talking about on a sheet of paper. I, suspect, I suggest that we have, what time do we have to finish? Notice the switch over at 10 past. So, right. Is that still the time target? What? I mean, let's, let's have a buzz for five minutes and then see what that kind of is. So, um, there you have it. And um, that's what we would have said in Create. And you'll find a lot of it on the website. So, let me.